refugees and threatening food security. These criminals target weaknesses in national jurisdictions. This may be by use of corruption, taking advantage of legal loopholes, or taking advantage of countries' weaknesses at monitoring, control, and surveillance systems at sea, in ports and at the borders where the fisheries products are traded. The vessels used by these criminal networks have a number of points in common. They may have multiple counterfeit identities and flags. They may not be registered by any state. They carry out illegal transshipments and their crews obstruct boardings by law enforcement and regulatory agencies. The damage caused by illegal fishing goes far beyond the fisheries themselves. Fisheries crime is transnational in nature and has links to other crimes such as money laundering, document fraud, tax evasion, forced labor, and human trafficking. While these crimes are directly connected to illegal fishing business operations, it is important for enforcement officers to be aware that fishing vessels are also used to smuggle independent commodities such as drugs, firearms, and people, and are even used for piracy and terrorist attacks. Due to their highly nomadic navigation patterns and long periods at sea, fishing vessels are able to blend into the maritime background without raising suspicion. Since 2013, Interpol has been engaged in combating illegal fishing and supports national law enforcement authorities in their endeavor to detect and suppress fisheries-related crime. This is achieved through raising awareness of fisheries crime, conducting operations to suppress criminal activities in the fisheries sector, and providing recommendations on effective enforcement methods. Interpol acts as a neutral platform for the global exchange of law enforcement information and provides guidance, coordination, and assistance to all of its member countries. Interpol is committed to addressing the range of crimes related to the fisheries sector. These include illegal fishing, fraud, tax evasion, corruption, and money laundering, as well as the use of fishing vessels to traffic drugs, weapons, and forced labor. The Environmental Security Program is receiving external financial support from both governmental and non-governmental organizations and is grateful to our donors who have made our work against IUU fishing sustainable for the past decade. While USAID supports our work with Latin American countries, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources has allowed us to enhance national investigative capabilities, which in turn reduce illegal fishing and associated crimes in the Southern Ocean. Although progress has been achieved, further global concerted efforts are required to effectively address these crimes, which often involve transnational organized criminal networks. Interpol will continue to support its 195 member countries in combating all types of transnational crime as no country or region alone can tackle these threats. Notwithstanding the achievements so far by Interpol Environmental Security Program, we remain steadfast on our course toward eradication of illegal fishing and building sustainable law enforcement cooperation to prevent our oceans from criminal threats. Thank you, and I wish you a fruitful meeting. I am delighted now to introduce our next panel on upholding the rules-based order in practice. We will hear from Dr. Tony Press, former Australian Camelar Commissioner and head of the Australian Antarctic Division, Megan and Gelke Ross from NOAA's General Counsel Enforcement Section, and we are lucky to have Humaira Pamuk, foreign, Senior Foreign Policy Correspondent at Reuters, to chair this panel. Thank you. Hello, this is working, right? Okay, um, I'm Humaira Pamuk. I'm a, a foreign policy correspondent. I mostly cover the State Department. Um, and I know very little about Antarctica. 
Um, when they contacted me for uh, for this panel, I was actually very excited because we cover a wide range of things at Reuters foreign policy, mostly Ukraine these days, a lot of China. I write about the Arctic, but Antarctica uh, is an area that we almost never write a story about. And I found just that itself, just this fact, very, very intriguing. Why, why don't we write about Antarctica? Why don't we think about Antarctica more? So um, I, um, I'm very excited that I have uh, these two amazing experts here that I will ask about all of the things that I'm curious about. I know that it's after lunch, but I would um, highly encourage you to ask questions as well. We're going to try to do this um, as interactive as possible. Um, so I just want to get to it right away. Um, I was reading uh, about you know, the history of Antarctica and some of the things, some of the themes that have been rising over the past couple of years and have been reading about Tony's actually uh, writings. And um, in, in a recent paper, he talks about how, the, how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the biggest disturbance, the perturbation of the Antarctic Treaty system so far. And he, of course, like mentions climate change is well, one of the greatest threats. So um, I would like to start with that, basically. Um, and if Tony can tell us um, the lay of the land, like what are we looking at here? Um, the United States on mainstream national security areas uh, thinks a lot about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It also thinks a lot about China's assertiveness in the Pacific uh, and elsewhere. If you can give us uh, a sense of how things have been in the Ant Antarctic, and as I said, I write about the Arctic, which which had been, which has been a stable place relatively, but similar threats are creeping up there as well. Is there any chance of those kinds of threats creeping up in the Antarctic, and what can be done? That's a broad canvas. Thank you. Um, so, for my sins, um, I was also the head or deputy head of the. Australian delegation to Antarctic Treaty meetings from 1999 to 2009. Kamala Commissioner uh, I was for a decade, 1998 to 2008. <coughs> and um, I've spent the last period since then working in climate change, uh, but also increasingly more in Antarctic geopolitical um, scholarly activities and working with the Australian government and other, other governments on um, Antarctic law uh, and policy. I'll start off b by saying, um, and I'll get to the nub of your question at the end, but I'll start off by saying that Australia and the US have very close common interests in Antarctica, especially those interests that are focused on peace and security in the region. And we've had those common interests confirmed in the Antarctic Treaty itself, and that, that was discussed this morning. So as we face the challenges uh, in the future, we need to understand those commonalities and work with those commonalities. The Antarctic Treaty itself, being this Cold War product that set Antarctica aside for peace and science, was underpinned by an open-ended inspection regime. So as a post-World War II disarmament treaty, a, a nuclear test ban treaty, uh, and uh, a regional framework that um, prohibited military manoeuvres, 
the underscoring of that was an open-ended inspection regime. That is, that any party could inspect any other party's facilities in Antarctica and their ships uh, as they were um, <coughs> loading or unloading in Antarctica at any time without notice. It was also a novel um, provision at the time that those inspections could be done by aerial observation. And we'll come back to what aerial observation means in the, in the uh, common, um, in, in, in today's framework. It's, it's an interesting question and something that we should be working on. So where are the challenges to the Antarctic Treaty System arising now? What are they? Uh, who's behind them? What's behind them? And where might they lead into the future? And what should we be doing to respond to those challenges? Those challenges are, are, are a broad suite of, of things. The first are challenges to the norms, modes and practices of, of, of meetings, agreements, how decisions are made. Um, and that's an insidious form of, of challenge because you don't actually realise that a, a norm or practice has changed until after it's changed. And one of the most important things that we should be doing now is, is actually looking at behaviours and practices in other parts of the world and seeing how they're changing and how they may change in Antarctica. That's a, uh, an intelligence gathering exercise, uh, but one that we should be looking at and saying, well, OK, if that was to happen in the Antarctic regime, how should we deal with it now? So one of these things is this concept of best available science. And the term best available science is used almost universally in any of the treaties, any of the agreements inside the Antarctic Treaty System. And that is that you make decisions based on the best available science. Doesn't mean that that science has to be complete. Doesn't mean that that science has to be perfect. It just means that that science is what is available right now that can help you make a preemptive decision about something. Maybe a catch limit on, on a, a fishery or whether emperor penguins should be listed as in danger or not. And particularly in the last five years, there have been challenges coming from Russia uh, and from China to this concept of best available science. So, for instance, China is now saying, with respect to some of the arguments about, about marine protected areas, that there shouldn't be a protected area declared until you have proof that something is going to be damaged or that there is um, a, an environmental change taking place that needs to be protected. That's not best available science. That's most likely impossible science ever uh, to be <laughs> delivered. You can keep on saying that science is not good enough until uh, the cows come home and you'll never get to the end of that question. The second challenge is to the basic decision-making operation system in the Antarctic Treaty System. And decisions throughout the Antarctic Treaty System are actually made by consensus. And one of the practices that... It, it happened in the past. Um, Russia did this, or the Soviet Union did this in the 80s, um, refusing to actually implement any 
fisheries related measures for a long period of time uh, in the Southern Ocean by blocking consensus. It's re-emerged now as a means of stopping decisions being made on marine protected areas, on the listing of emperor penguins uh, and a, a, a bunch of other uh, important decisions inside the Antarctic Treaty System, including, as my colleague on the right will um, introduce you to in a little while, including uh, listing vessels uh, on IUU um, blacklists. The principle here, though, is to understand what consensus actually means. Consensus doesn't mean that everybody has to agree. Consensus means that nobody disagrees, that you get to a point at which you've negotiated an outcome that you can live with. And that was the practice uh, during the period of time that I was involved in, in Antarctic affairs. It may have taken a while to get, uh, to get agreements made, um, but there was always a spirit of getting an agreement. Uh, and now we've seen in recent years um, some challenges to, to that um, spirit of finding a solution to a difficult problem. So we were able to get around um, objections to introducing catch documentation schemes for toothfish, for getting vessel monitoring regimes in place for fishing vessels. We negotiated a very difficult set of, of, um, of uh, agreements um, behind the scenes about Australia's um, provision to the Commission on the <coughs> Limits of the Continental Shelf data related to Antarctica, to Australia's Antarctic claim. We, we actually ended up uh, <coughs> by giving the Commission the data but asking them not to look at it or interpret it. Those negotiations were conducted behind the scenes. A consensus view of, of how it should be dealt with was, was reached. And so we were able to avert a crisis there. Um, the blocking of the Minerals Convention, as was mentioned in the session before, um, the, before lunch, uh, where Australia and France and then eventually a cavalcade of others decided not to actually <coughs> sign a convention that they'd agreed to uh, a few months earlier and then to, in, in rapid period of time, within two years, to negotiate a new agreement, the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, which has an indefinite mining ban in it, consensus was able to be re-established very rapidly after that crisis. Um, and um, the spirit of consensus lived um, on. But the last couple of years, both China and Russia have challenged that willingness to reach an agreement by using, for different reasons, um, their power to block consensus, Russia by basically being a, a, a bad player in international affairs, China by trying to make sure that nothing in um, the global environment preempted um, decisions they might want to make. Uh, in the future, and consensus has been extremely difficult um, to to reach. I will come to the question of um, what can be done in a little while. We both will, but I'll just finish off by talking about the invasion of illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. That has created 
coinciding with um, COVID-19, um, a destabilization and has unleashed uh, bad negotiating practices throughout um, the Antarctic Treaty System. And it'll take some time to get over that. I think it can be overcome, uh, but at the moment, uh, it is a major destabilising feature of the Antarctic Treaty System. I'm going to hand over to Megan to um, bring you up to date on what's happening inside uh, the Kamala regime. Thank you, Tony. Um, this little microphone stand is heavier than it looks. Um, <laughs> so as... Um, as Tony said, we do work really well and um, collaboratively with um, Australia on Antarctic issues. And it's a particular privilege for me to be sitting with Tony on this panel. Actually, um, Tony helped me at my first meeting when we were proposing, along with Australia, changes to the system of inspection in Kamlar that is the regime under which members can inspect the vessels of other members operating in the convention area to monitor compliance, and it's sorely outdated. And I arrived at the meeting, my very first international marine resource meeting, with instructions from the interagency that there were provisions in the proposal that were really problematic for the United States, and I march over and, you know, express my willingness to negotiate over them, and Tony leans forward and says, this is all based on something Bill Gibbons Fly wrote, <laughs> which was news to me and, and taught me a lot of lessons about learning this job on the fly. Um, I want to thank um, Evan and the Wilson Center and the organizers for this. I could talk about these issues all day, and it's a pleasure to see so many people here. But um, I do want to say my comments are going to be focused really on Kamlar. I, actually strangely don't know that much about the ATCM <laughs> or the environmental protocol, even though I've been working on Antarctic issues for a long time. But there's a lot to discuss in the Kamlar context about how the rules-based order works in practice when it comes to compliance. And that's the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about. Um, my job in the U.S. government at NOAA is um, as Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Section of our Office of General Counsel, which is the office that is charged with enforcing the um, domestic federal marine resource laws, including the statute that implements the Kamler Convention. And we just had an office meeting in San Diego a couple of weeks ago, and one of my colleagues made the comment that is – sort of summarizes the view that a lot of us in the enforcement world have, that if there's no enforcement, then regulations are really just a wish. And I think that's really true. You can have a really strong regime that you hope will accomplish your conservation and management goals. And in Kamlar, it's really a, a conservation goal, which is exciting to work on. Um, but if you have no enforcement of those rules, then it's kind of a voluntary scheme. And some people will comply just because they are rule followers, and some people won't comply. Um, I call this sort of the don't be a yutz theory of fisheries <laughs> management, which is no one wants to be the idiot who is following the rules if other people are getting away with not following them. And that work is true in the domestic context, but it's also true in the international context where the rules are not binding on individuals or entities or vessels, they're binding on the states that are party to the agreement. And so nobody, you know, we hear all the time, not so much in Kamlar where we don't fish, but um, in other settings from our industry that they don't want to be stuck with um, being subject to U.S. implementation and compliance of really rigorous and onerous requirements when vessels operating under other flags are not are not bound in that way. So since all enforcement is really state-based, there is no Kamlar police force, there is no, people you know, have a misunderstanding about what Interpol does, but there's no international body out there bringing people to justice for fishing violations. So in the international context, it works by um, two mechanisms. One, the, um, the speaker from Interpol kind of alluded to, and Tony did as well, 
is in the kind of rogue vessel context where we call them IUU vessels, which are illegal, unreported, and unregulated vessels, which are sometimes stateless, sometimes operated by irresponsible, flagged by irresponsible flag states, flags of convenience, um, that get um, discussed internationally different bodies, including CAMLAR, all of the regional fishery management organizations that manage tuna and other internationally managed stocks have IUU vessel lists. And the vessels on IUU vessel lists are subject to kind of world scorn. The, the, the measures that establish these lists require members of the organizations that adopt them to restrict access to port services, entry into port, um, importation of catch from the vessels on these lists. And we've had a lot of success in Camlar actually addressing the IUU vessels that were a real scourge at, when I first started going to Camlar, um, in part with cooperation through Interpol, but basically the vessels were hounded and, you know, we worked cooperatively, the US, Australia, Interpol, through Interpol and otherwise with other governments, I'm probably leaving some out to find states that were in a position to exercise jurisdiction over these vessels. And I think they, the real bad actors from back in those days were um, have mostly been eliminated. There's a fascinating book on um, the early days of Camlar IU vessels called Hooked. And there's also a film about the, um, the thunder. I think it's called Chasing the Thunder that um, gets a lot of things wrong, but you would get the gist. But the bread and butter of compliance monitoring really relates to the countries that are bound by these measures and the and the vessels and entities and nationals that are subject to their jurisdiction and how they implement and enforce um, the rules that Camlar agrees to. And um, Camlar has 37 contracting parties and 26 members. So I think somebody this morning was talking about how ATCM relates to the Antarctic Treaty, and it's the same in Camlar. So all the contracting party countries to the Camlar Convention are um, bound by the measures, by the treaty itself and the measures that Camlar adopts. The 26 members get to participate in decision making. Um, so adoption of new measures and um, some of the other discussions that um, I'm going to talk about in a minute about how we discuss compliance and what to do. Um, going back to briefly before I, I touch on that, I do want to say one last thing about IU vessel lists, which is they, are, they have been, as I said, a pretty effective tool for dealing with non-contracting party vessels and in particular stateless vessels. They're not a particularly useful tool for dealing with contracting party vessels, particularly in Camlar, for the reasons that um, have been alluded to related to consensus-based decision making. So we have had a few vessels, contracting party vessels, um, nominated for the IUU vessel list, the contracting party one, but only in the time I've been in Camlar, which is a very long time, since 2007, um, only three that I'm aware of that have actually ended up on the list. Two were Chinese vessels, four were Chinese vessels, the, um, the four oceans vessels, which were listed prior to China becoming a member of Kamlar. And the last was a South African vessel, and I really think that that was actually like a, a snafu on the part of the government of South Africa related to the virtual meeting that we had during Kamlar, um, during that year. Um, so it's it's just not a great a great tool for that. Far better is to take a look at monitoring compliance of contracting parties and then to evaluate how well measures are being implemented and enforced. So Camlar has um, adopted a range of monitoring measures to help um, assess member compliance. Um, and back when I started in Camlar, we were actually, as an organization, quite ahead of the pack. I think probably because of the idealistic spirit of cooperation in the Antarctic, we were among the first organizations to have a centralized vessel monitoring system, which is a system where vessel positions are um, reported by satellite, either through the flag state or directly to the Camlar Secretariat. Um, we have a catch documentation scheme that monitors and documents toothfish catch from the point of harvest through to final import for consumption. We have transshipment requirements. We have observer requirements. We have port inspection requirements. We have an at sea 
um, inspection regime. Um, and um, trying to think what, those are the main things that I can think of right now. But we have a range of measures. Um, we have haul by haul catch reporting in some of our fisheries. So we have quite a lot of data coming into the Secretariat to establish how well the CAMLA rules are being complied with. And we also have a compliance evaluation procedure that I think was adopted in 2010. Um, up until that point, we had discussions about implementation and compliance, but they were a little bit less formalized. And probably because of that, they were slightly less transparent and maybe not quite as even-handed in the way um, similar kinds of issues were treated. So we have a process now where the Secretariat compiles a bunch of information and um, the information is provided to contracting parties related to their um, compliance issues. They can report back new information, actions they've taken in response. They can refute things. Um, and then they are invited to give a voluntary assessment of the seriousness of their issue and any need for further action. And it's been a bit of a rocky road. Um, but by and large, I think we've made progress over time. We use it as a mechanism um, for identifying portions and provisions of the measures themselves that are ambiguous or confusing or where, you know, in one language it might say that you shall do something and in another language it might say you may do it. Um, those kinds of issues I think we've been able to, to take action to improve. And over time we've seen people countries taking responsibility for their enforcement issues and being more comfortable doing that, admitting that there is an issue and um, admitting that it constitutes noncompliance and agreeing to things that they might do in response. And as a result of that, um, we now see something like 97% compliance across most, like as an average, across CAMLAR measures. Um, there have been a couple of instances where countries that had been, I don't want to say bad actor countries, but countries that maybe were not fulfilling their obligations have used being called out on in this report as um, a means of generating political will to actually, you know, maybe take actions that industry may be pressuring, pressuring government not to take, that kind of thing. And I think it's been a real success in that arena. But there are um, challenges, as Tony said. Um, we have some countries that really will feel free to stop the entire discussion of compliance because they have one minor thing and having a minor thing called out is too horrific. And you know, so they'll stop the whole meeting and call for heads of delegation to meet in a side room. Um, and we have a country that refuses to ever take enforcement action. Um, and just sort of stonewalls. And I think most troubling um, for those of us who are working hard to support the CAMLAR framework is the notion that sometimes the basis of that is questioning the legitimacy of the information provided. So, you know, there's a long history in CAMLAR of information from port inspections and at sea inspections and aerial surveillance to be used as the basis for discussions of compliance and generally the notion is that we are co-equal sovereigns and if you know the enforcement authorities of another member of CAMLA are telling you that your vessel was out of compliance or operating where um, it shouldn't have been that you would take that information this you would treat it the same way that you would treat information from your own authorities and that really hasn't been the case um, with respect to to a certain country <laughs> and um, and I think that that really kind of stops things in its tracks um, because the only real consequence of all of this is just sort of acknowledgement of a failure to comply and a commitment to do better. But if you're not willing to admit, then there's we're kind of our hands are a bit tied about other consequences. And I think that um, leaves parties to CAMLAR in a position of trying to find mechanisms outside the regime to, to be, respond to these intractable issues. So I'm sorry for being a little opaque, <laughs> but, um, but maybe Tony will be able to speak a little bit more freely <laughs> on some of those issues. But, and, and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Okay. Can I take this? No, I can't. Okay. Um, I just want to ask a couple of follow-ups to both of you, and then um, I'll open it up for, for questions. Um, first, Megan, who are these countries? <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, they're the countries we've been talking about all day. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess in that sense, this question is going to make sense for both of you. Um, Tony talked about how it's become really difficult to uh, reach a consensus and I'm basically wondering, what is your impression, Tony, that uh, Russia is trying to achieve from its point of view? And what is China trying to achieve? Um, again, slight sort of compare contrast to the Arctic. Uh, they have similar uh, goals over there as well. One is shorter term, one is longer term. They have different tactics. I'm wondering if that's the case in Antarctica as well. Um, and for you, Megan, how does that, you know, translate to enforcement? How does that make your lives more difficult? And whether there is a mechanism to to counter that? Okay, well, I'll I'll start off. I think um, both China and Russia, uh, and and there may be other countries h hiding behind them, but but in the in the front line, both China and Russia at the moment are using um, a particular tactic um, that is blocking consensus or not agreeing, um, find, finding endless questions to ask so that uh, consensus is never reached. Um, I think they're using the same tactic, but I, I don't think they have exactly the same um, reason for doing so. Uh, R Russia's rather shambolic uh, and has been for the last little while. And there, um, in Kamala, for instance, uh, some, of the, some of their delegation um, are deeply entrenched in uh, the fishing uh, oligarchy of, 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 of Russia. So they, they have a very... Um, sectional, some, some of their delegation has a very sectional yeah, interest and they wield um, a great amount of, 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 of influence inside the delegation, uh, probably uh, much more than their, their, their status in the government or being outside of government would warrant. China, on the other hand, um, has uh, the long view uh, and at the moment, I think um, they they are f making sure that their options for the future remain open. They don't want decisions made uh, in the Antarctic Treaty or in the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources or in the... Um, or recommendations coming from the Committee for Environmental Protection. They don't want decisions that might preempt their future options. And, and that's the long game that they're playing at the moment, and that's, that's where they are. Now, it mightn't stay like that forever, but it could stay like that for quite some time. And so we have to think I th about how we... We, we work in that environment and how we respond to that. Um, just by way of example, Russia's behaviour in, in the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources right now is not dissimilar to the way that they were behaving in the 1980s, um, particularly 1982 through to about 1989. And then the Soviet Union started to fall apart um, things got leaked out of uh, uh, the Soviet Union about what was really going on in their Antarctic fisheries. Uh, and there was a big change uh, in, in, in um, the attitude of, of the um, Russian delegation in the 90s. Um, so these things can change. It's usually a crisis that makes them change, but they, they, they can change. Um, um, the, 
where else was I going to go? <laughs> I think that's the that that's basically the the um, the, the the manifestation of 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 that consensus blocking uh, behaviour. Now we have to get smarter, those that actually want to see progress, uh, but we also have to get. Um, our head around how we act in the whole of the Antarctic Treaty System to overcome these obstacles uh, and in fact to address some of the questions that, that were raised in this morning's panel um, by um, Anne-Marie Brady and Klaus Dodds and Evan Bloom and others. Um, we, we need to look at uh, what our options are in the future and how we should address those emerging issues. To you. Yep. Um, well, so you were saying, how does that... How does that translate into enforcement? I mean, you you have talked about these countries, but perhaps yeah. you can unpack so that a So to be bit. a little bit uh, more clear, um, I think that what we see in compliance discussions in CAMLAR is... Um, Generally, that China, like along the lines of what Tony was alluding to, is reluctant to agree to measures that will impose new restrictions or new monitoring on their fleet. Um, they are generally not um, non-compliant with the rules that exist, but it's really hard to get them to acknowledge non-compliance, even if it's insanely, if it, even if it's quite minor. Um, and I will say, in Camlar, because of the nature of the Antarctic, the size of the fleet, the extent of the monitoring, we have very detailed discussions about compliance and some of the issues that we discuss are very minor. Um, they're not things that you would necessarily even discuss at all in another international body. And we've tried to, by inviting people to assess their own compliance, minimize how much we have to talk about them as a group. But we will talk about things like, in Camlar, you have to notify the commission as you move between sub areas within the Antarctic and in, in the convention area and right now on the compliance table there are people who you know notified that they were moving from one area to another but the notification was a few hours late um, maybe even a few minutes late so um, in general we can dispose of those quickly but there is one of those issues involving a Chinese vessel and I expect a protracted discussion about it at the meeting this year despite the fact that it's relatively minor. Um, Russia is the country that refuses to acknowledge um, enforcement information provided by other um, members. And it's been really hard for the commission to deal with. I think, in large, it's crazy making, um, honestly, because as Klaus was saying this morning, you know, there's a, a lot of the rules are dependent on shared norms and values. And when there is operation outside those norms and values, it is really hard to know what to do. Um, I know in the U.S., with respect to one of their vessels, one of the tools that we have is, as I, I forget who said it this morning, but the United States is the um, primary, the lead importer of um, marine resources harvested in the Antarctic, So, um, and we have obligations under the catch documentation scheme and our domestic regulations and other federal law to... Um, restrict trade to product that we think was harvested illegally to protect our supply chain um, and our own domestic fisheries. So we have that tool, um, but it is, it's really hard. And I think what we've tried to do as a commission is continue to talk about the norms and values, continue to be even-handed and transparent and non-retaliatory so that there can't be accusations of hypocrisy and just kind of uphold the order as the best we can, but it has been a very frustrating time for a few different issues. I can imagine. Um, so we have, I think, like uh, 10, 15-ish minutes. 10, okay. Um, and I would just like to open it to the floor. I have a, oh, okay. That gentleman over there, please, here. Thank you very much. Matthew Budeg, uh, Wilson Center from the panel earlier. Tony, I've been teasing that question <laughs> since this morning. Um, another important aspect of disruption and potential disruption coming from Russia and China has to do with their form of soft power influence or sharp power influence over certain countries in Latin America, South America, Africa, 
uh, Indonesia as well as we've seen some Chinese uh, outreach towards Vanuatu, for instance, or uh, Papua New Guinea. Is there a, f a risk in, in, your, in your eyes that there might be some disruptions moving forward in terms of um, specifically China trying to push for a more Beijing prone understanding of future norms and regulations? Um, and if you take the parallel to the Arctic as r China claiming to be in the Arctic stake and trying to create a coalition of New Arctic states that could change sort of government facts on the ground. Do, do you foresee a sort of similar environment for the ATS uh, moving forward with China tagging along, with China basically making the norms and Russia tagging along? Or are we in complete science fiction, hopefully? Um, no, I don't think we're in complete isolation. I think we can, um, quite honestly, we can see some of that happening at the moment. Um, uh, Chinese influence, say, uh, in uh, South Africa um, is, is manifest, I think, in, 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 in some ways, um, at least subtly. Interestingly, though, there's a big movement in South Africa, environmental movement in South Africa at the moment that's targeting Russia, which, uh, in Russia in the Antarctic, which is a really interesting dynamic. But I think uh, people spoke this morning about um, the about BRICS, uh, I, these, these, ki these um, influences have happened in the past. I don't think we're immune from them. That's why I said that we have to look um, globally at what's happening and see how that might manifest itself in the future uh, in the Antarctic. Hi. Um, well, I, I wanted to respond to a couple of points. So, first of all, on um, ra the Russia's agenda, um, a couple of colleagues and I wrote about Russia's smart power in Antarctica and in the Polar Journal in 2016. And what we found is, uh, I interviewed Val Vladimir um, Lukin, who was long-term head of the Russian Antarctic Expedition, and he told me that he got the air and the budget from Putin from um, to when they'd been in such a terrible state um, in the, in after the Cold War, the Russian Antarctic Expedition was so badly funded that there was even near starvation in one of the bases at, at one point. Um, by talking about the strategic interests and the strategic significance of Antarctica. And, and the GLONASS was a real awareness of the importance of GLONASS for Russia and an alternative a, a global navigation system that Russia must have for its own uh, military defence um, really focused the mind of Putin. So um, Mr Lukin told me. So even though, of course, the Russian... Russia is very busy in Ukraine now and will have um, even less resources than before when I visited the Russian Antarctic Expedition and it looks like you're in the back in the 1950s when you go there in their building. Um, they can be a spoiler in the Antarctic system by just using their veto and we've seen that again and again and we're also seeing it in other climate negotiations. So you can expect that to go forward. And as for China, um, <coughs> whether or not that question about whether China is ch trying to share its agenda or narrative or build a consensus amongst other states who are Antarctic players, absolutely yes. And I wrote about this, uh, and also in the Arctic, I wrote about this in my book, China is a Polar Great Power. China's been targeting one by one um, sort of key stakeholders in the Arctic and Antarctic, as in other parts of the global governance system like in the United Nations. And when it comes to and using things like economic uh, links, uh, developing e economic development and investment, um, and United Front work, political interference, you name it. But when it comes to um, Antarctica, one of the consensus points that, that China is working towards is something that, you know, I remember it was Chris Joyner, that's right, Christopher Joyner said that um, the environmental protocol was the end of sort of cont contention in the Pacific, uh, sorry, in the Antarctica, and just now the shared values was mentioned. And the sad thing is those shared values were not shared. They weren't shared in Russia and they weren't definitely weren't shared in China. And you had to read the sources in the original language to see that. And so the values that, I, I'm not saying the scientists don't have those. Chinese scientists love the Antarctic environment just like it, Russian uh, and um, New Zealand and the US scientists do too. But the government who motivates, who has a motivation to spend the money uh, has a different narrative. And so the narrative um, that China has, the playbook that China works from, 
is, for example, that Antarctic um, uh, mineral exploitation and the, cha the, the, the environmental protocol that's on it now, that will, it's a matter of time that that will end. And, you know, it looked impossible, you would think, um, but it's not impossible because Cramer was, pri uh, 33 countries agreed to mineral exploitation in 1988. It was just Australia for its own national interests that said no. Um, Paul Keating didn't think that Australia was getting a good deal out of that, whereas France, Mitterrand, it was more about the environment. Uh, so anything's possible in environmental governance. Um, and definitely China is building up ad that agenda amongst interested partner states and, um, and, and on other issues too in Antarctica. So this is the, the thing, is to keep an eye on that and think about what the US wants to do. Thank you for that contribution. Um, uh, gentleman at the very back. Um, that, just just a, um, a question to the panel, really. I, I'd really welcome your thoughts about the fallout from the Palmer incident, and um, because I think that was kind of referenced subtly. Um, would you would you care to be a little bit more? transparent about <laughs> the awkwardness that that created because I think for me personally that was an absolute game changer in terms of what we were dealing with in terms of bad faith acting. Um, well, I don't. I want to jump on on Tony, but I, I, he did allude a little bit to so the the situation um, with the Palmer. There's a long saga, but the the most recent situation related to um, New Zealand conducting aerial surveillance in the convention area and sighting the Palmer operating in an area vastly different from the area where its VMS was reporting it as operating to Kemmler, and in fact, in a closed area. So, um, and the reaction from, and it, this was supported with other information. I think there was retrieved gear. There were photographs of um, gear in an inspection, I think, that occurred before the vessel left. And I might be getting some of these facts wrong, but this is the gist. Um, and then an inspection that happened at sea, and the Russians came back with some, oh, well, those pictures are not the right pictures. That gear that you retrieved from the water is not the gear on our vessel. Here's a picture of the gear from our vessel. And I, I think the uh, compliance officer from the UK said, did they just put those hooks on a duvet? It was just the weirdest um, situation. So it has been very destabilizing because normally you would expect – um, there to be disagreement about whether or not something was serious, whether or not what the flag state did in response to the issue was adequate, you know, was the fine enough, you know, you know, some countries will routinely just issue a stern warning to their vessels and others take, um, you know, more sub substantial action. But this was, I think, one of the few instances where it was just complete um, refuting. So we had data that showed all the other vessels operating in the area. We had um, videos. It was like a, you know, and they would come back and say, well, we got this data from the, from the New Zealand government, but it didn't include the metadata. So we have no way of knowing if it was altered. Um, and it kind of went on for years. You know, the first year they said, we'll look into it. Then they just stopped doing that. Um, it's been really, it was really destabilizing, I think, as you say, for the discussion, because it changed the... Um, sort of ground rules for what we for how we were going to talk about it. Tony, do you want to address this or I have one like I'm going to give you guys the floor for closing remarks with I, I, a I've got a closing remark. That's okay. All. Um a couple of more minutes. Okay. I just want you to I would love it if you could also address when uh you were answering your previous question, you said we have to be smarter about all of this. Okay. Th that yep. was that was my closing remarks. Oh. Um to quote a uh a Russian, uh, what is to be done? Well, there's smart people in this room and I, I, I'll just go briefly through the things that I think need to be done. I, we need to overcome uh, this impasse. But one of the ways of overcoming it uh, has to be based on understanding. The inspection regime is the one way of understanding what's happening 
in Antarctica. It's also one way of understanding dual use. It's also one way of understanding whether there is covert military activities happening in Antarctica. It's also one way of understanding generally what's going on. Now, inspections are expensive and difficult, but we must do them. But I also think we need to look at the inspection regime and we need to, to modernise aerial observation in order to uh, be able to carry out inspections in a way that's cheaper uh, than it is at the moment. Reporting, we have to set the examples. The like-minders have to set the example about reporting their activities in Antarctica and we have to pressure other countries to comply with those reporting um, requirements. And then there is understanding understanding is extremely important and we have to use our national assets as they're called to actually understand what's going on and then the like-minded to act in a way that uses that understanding to promote um, compliance uh, and, and, and transparency and mutual assurance in Antarctica. They are really important and the very last thing is outreach and capacity building. We have to outreach to other Antarctic Treaty parties and build their capacity to respond uh, to these challenges. Do you have any final remarks or? Um, I don't unless you have a final question. I would just say that in the, in the compliance context as well. I think we're a little bit behind in Camlar and than some other organizations. There is not the large um, developing country presence that you see like in a TUNO organization, for example. And so there's not the tradition of doing a lot of capacity building and outreach. But we see, I think we see examples of where um, other countries could be brought along into the fold of countries that are working to monitor compliance in the Camlar Convention area um, and in with respect to say port inspections and those are arduous things but there's quite a lot of experience around the world in providing that kind of capacity building. Great. Thank you to this wonderful panel. Thank you. I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Mike Safraga, Chair and Distinguished Fellow at the Wilson Center and Chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. Thank you very much, Becca. Uh, I get to share my, my welcome with all of my friends and colleagues here. Thank you to our colleagues for that last panel. I have the honor of uh, introducing our next speaker, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who has joined the Wilson Center at least on three occasions that I can remember uh, to speak about the Arctic and the Antarctic. I think most recently we shared a stage in, in Reykjavik speaking about the Arctic writ large. And Becca, you and the team have done a great job of bringing together the Antarctic community here in D.C., much like we tried to do, and I think have succeeded in bringing the Arctic community together here in, here in uh, D.C., but also globally as well. We tried to do what the Polar Institute is to create a place that you can have these really important Arctic discussions, and I think this conference it highlights the importance of doing the same thing for the Antarctic. And when the Wilson Center first decided to create an institute, it was first focused on the Arctic. We made the argument quickly that we must remember that there's the Antarctic. Perhaps it was the Greeks channeling to us, not, not to forget uh, the southern continent as well. So I think it's a wonderful thing, not just for the Wilson Center, but for the Arctic, the Antarctic, uh, and for the polar community to bring us all together. Uh, as Becca noted, the Wilson Center sits strategically very different perhaps than some other organizations. We are a creature of Congress created to have nonpartisan perspectives uh, on the issues of the day. If you read the, read the paper 10 years ago, maybe you heard about the Arctic and maybe you heard about the Antarctic. If you read about it today, you're hearing about the Arctic and more and more you're hearing about the Antarctic. So I can't think of a more timely conference than what Becca and her team have put together for the time in which we live. I have the honor, as I said, to, to introduce uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, many of you know the Senator's work, but let me just be very brief about, about it. He is one of the leading proponents in Congress to protect the world's oceans. He
He co-founded and co-chairs the Senate's Bipartisan Oceans Caucus and co-wrote the Senate's Bipartisan Oceans Caucus, excuse me, wrote and co-sponsored the, both the Save Our Seas and Save Our Seas 2.0 Acts. The Save Our Seas Act stands as a major piece of legislation aimed at passing an important, very important pieces of legislation on maritime security, maritime innovation, marine mammal protection, and I could keep going. Senator Whitehouse can be described as a champion for all of us in the work that we do within the Senate, and we're grateful that he's sharing this time with us today. Please welcome Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Great. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you to the Wilson Center for organizing this. I think it seems to uh, a lot of my constituents that uh, Antarctica is a pretty damn long way away, and it can be a little hard to explain why Antarctica matters. Um, but along with the Greenland ice sheet, Antarctica presents the single uh, most real and immediate threat of very significant sea level rise getting out of control. And in Rhode Island, we have a Coastal Resources Management Council, our CZMA agency, that has done very, very good mapping because FEMA's mapping was so horrible and false. Uh, so we've actually done good mapping, and the good mapping shows that Rhode Island's coastline changes quite dramatically in the years ahead. And uh, we lose a lot of our coastline, and for our small ocean state, that is a very, very big deal. So I look at Antarctica, Antarctica with uh, considerable interest. It just set a, a sea ice record low in 2023, so things are not going in the right direction. In the Senate Budget Committee, I focused a lot on what bankers and finance people call the systemic risks from climate change, which are the risks that aren't confined to the people who are subject to the risk, but which cascade out through the economy and take the whole economy down the way the horrible mortgages of uh, 2008 took basically the whole economy out. You didn't just have to have a bad mortgage to be hurt. And there are several of them. But one of the leading ones is sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise and added storm risk creating uninsurability in coastal properties which in turn creates unmortgageability in coastal properties, which in turn creates what Freddie Mac, not exactly a green organization, a mortgage organization, uh, predicts will be a coastal property values crash that cascades through the entire US economy. Now, that's just one of several climate risks, but it's one that's highly pertinent to uh, making sure that we keep an eye on what's going on in, uh, in Antarctica and resolve the underlying climate problems that uh, are going to make things a good deal worse. Uh, I'm fond of saying we are not on a pathway to climate safety yet. In fact, we don't really have a pathway to climate safety yet in reach. So despite the IRA, which was a very good bill and will, I think, move us into the clean energy transition much more rapidly than we would have otherwise, there still is a lot more work to be done. And a few things that are going on that I'll commend to you right now, one is the recent uh, guidance by OMB to apply the social cost of carbon that's coming through EPA and the methane reg government-wide, across purchasing, across licensing, across fee setting, across environmental impact statements, pretty much wherever the hand of uh, executive agencies reach, the social cost of carbon at a real $190 per ton number uh, will be considered. And EPA is getting ready to finalize that regulation, I would say, within a matter of just a few weeks. So that will be a very, very powerful economic signal into a whole lot of markets uh, to adapt themselves. And uh, it's about as good as we can do on a domestic carbon price right now, given the state of our politics. Uh, the next is the Biden administration has just announced a methane task force, and we hope that it will look a little bit like a fire department. And in the same way that when a fire department sees smoke pouring out of the window in the neighborhood, the firefighters hit the poles, jump into their boots, get into the 
apparatus and head straight to the fire, when we detect through satellites enormous methane emissions, we'll be on it instantly with pulled permits, cease and desist orders, civil and criminal complaints, whatever it takes to put an end to the leakage. Once we have done that, then we have moral standing to push for better methane tracking and response around the rest of the world. And that can make a very, very big difference and could be a really good result of the COP. But again, we got to earn our spurs before we can try to tell everybody else in the world what to do. The last thing that's coming at us that needs, I think, a lot more attention is the European Union CBAM, which will put a carbon price on imports from countries and from industries in those countries that have a higher carbon intensity than the domestic industries in the EU. Again, a very powerful price signal. We can augment that by leaning into that, by joining up to match it as best we can, or we can whimper and whine and moan and complain and say we don't want to be a part of that. That would be a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake in my view because I think the EU CBAM is a good thing in and of itself. It's also a very significant forcing event in Congress to do our own tariff, and there is solid, well-supported, bipartisan work being done on a U.S. carbon border tariff. So if we can do that carbon border tariff, if we can have this methane task force act like a firefighting unit and not just another interagency task force, if we can have the social cost of carbon deployed effectively, executive branch-wide, and continue to implement the IRA effectively, we start to get close to a path to climate safety and the threat from the Antarctic to my shores, and if you're a coastal state, your shores uh, begins to abate. The Antarctic, just two other quick things. Plastics are starting to show up there like everywhere else. They're starting to show up in breast milk. They're starting to show up in the rain in Colorado. They're starting to show up pretty much wherever you look, and they're starting to show up in you know, the depths of the seas around the Antarctic and um, we need to get ahead of that. SOS and SOS 2.0 were the first big pieces of legislation. They helped encourage a much stronger U.S. role in Nairobi. The U.N. Treaty is going forward. We're hoping that that can be as forceful as uh, we can make it. Usually the U.S. has been the laggard in the international community. We hope that that will uh, change for the better. Uh, but there is progress being made with respect to plastics. And Dan Sullivan, who's my uh, compadre on that subject from uh, Alaska uh, and I are working on uh, SOS 3.0, which we hope will be bigger and better still. We took a pause after SOS 2.0 to veer into fisheries, and I'll mention the fisheries bill that he and I have completed and that is now waiting action in the Commerce Committee so that I hope we can get it into the next National Defense Authorization Bill with strong uh, bipartisan support. It basically puts some uh, sanctions on people who misbehave in the high seas, targeting both the pirate fishing fleets that misbehave all around the world, particularly and often in the sovereign waters of poorer countries that can't afford to identify who's in their waters, let alone defend against them, and the Chinese fleet, which has been weaponized to deliver uh, both cheap fish products back to Chinese markets and to provide a platform for a whole variety of military and intelligence activities by the Chinese government. So we're hoping that that bill can pass uh, quite quickly. Uh, if we get a little bit of help by being able to clear the High Seas Treaty, that would help even more. And who knows, if we're really on a roll, then perhaps behind the High Seas Treaty can become, at long last, the Law of the Seas Treaty, which has only been waiting around since uh, Claiborne Pell represented <laughs> Uh, Rhode Island. So we have a lot of um, good things going on. We're hoping that we can continue to make progress. Uh, the Blue Globe Bill, the National Ocean Exploration Bill, the Corals Bill. We were able to put a package together on oceans in the last NDAA, and uh, we hope to be able to continue those successes. All of that was very bipartisan, and um, we determined to hang together and try to get all of our things through rather than get ourselves picked off one by one, and it worked. We got five significant ocean bills passed in the NDAA. So we have uh, more work to do, but there is real progress being made, and I look forward to more. Um, just on a personal note, I think that um, people think about oceans a little bit differently than think about other issues. There is a sort of human reservoir of, of awe 
and respect and um, maybe even affection, if that's not too small a word, uh, when people have a lot of contact with the oceans. And I think um, that is not a partisan issue that exists on both sides of the aisle in the Senate. And the more we can tap into that, uh, the better off we are. Things are really getting bad. Um, I'll give you my last data point as, uh, as I head to the chair over there. The last data point is, is, is measured in zettajoules. What's a zettajoule, you may ask? What, what the hell is a joule, I would ask? A joule is the measure of heat energy, J-O-U-L-E, not J-E-W-E-L. And a zettajoule has 21 zeros in it. So it is what a Rhode Islander would call a seriously big-ass number. <laughs> and to put some uh, sort of tactile uh, measurement on it, the entire production and consumption of energy by humankind on the entire Earth amounts to one half a zettajoule of energy. And for the price of the fossil fuel component of that half zettajoule, we're dumping every year what looks to be over 14 zettajoules of heat into the oceans. About 30 times our entire human consumption of energy, because of the greenhouse effect, is being dumped into the ocean. So when you see coral reefs dying, when you see fisheries moving about, when you see waters off Florida at uh, jacuzzi temperatures, uh, there's something very, very real going on, and we've got to get ahead of it, or things are going to be very grim for the generations that follow us. So thanks very much for your attention to this, and the Antarctic is a, a key piece of it. <laughs> Wherever you'd like. Wherever you'd like, sir. Okay. Thank you, Senator. As, as always, um, I, I counted 21 questions uh, that were generated by your comments. We will not cover 21 questions, maybe three or four. We'll see how it goes. Right. I'm still trying to calculate out now the Senators zero. are required to speak in 20-minute increments. It's okay. The, there's a rule to that effect. They'd be here for a while. <laughs> uh, but thank you again for all of that. I, I'm not quite sure where to start, so I'm just going to pick one here. Um, you, you ended with this visceral sense of the oceans, right? The, the water, our, our affection to it, um, sometimes our fear of it. But what, but what we're doing to the oceans, how it serves us as a sink in a lot of good ways and bad ways, uh, is that visceral enough to move a discussion within Congress to show that Th these are global oceans that impact us, whether we're in Iowa or in Delaware or Rhode Island or in Alaska. Is that a way in? Because I search for the ways in for these very, what seem like disparate discussions, the yeah. Antarctic. Is that, is that a way in to match the ocean structures, the interconnectedness of that region to the home front in Iowa somewhere? It, I think, is a way uh, to a point. I think people have never seen the actual ocean will still go to an aquarium in a landlocked place and marvel at what they see. I think people have the time to be at sea for any amount of time, come to marvel on the wonders of what is around them. Um, and because the sea is so magnificent and so majestic and so massive, we have always assumed that we could more or less do anything to it and it would survive. We could use it as a dump for excess heat, for pollution, for whatever. We could employ really uh, unsound fisheries methods. Um, we could basically waste at will and the oceans would survive. And I think we've gotten to the point where our footprint on the earth is so heavy right now that it's not at all clear that that is true. And we have to start to think in those terms. And luckily, actually, strangely enough, some of our aquariums have done a very good job of starting to market that to people who come, that you know, we really are a, a bit at risk. And of course, the temperature of the planet and the ocean, a lot of the oxygen that we breathe and the circulation that has given us the uh, landside temperatures we've gotten used to in the last 25,000 years of human habitation all depend on the oceans continuing to be what they've been through that period. And because that is changing so dramatically, there's a very big story to be told. The fossil fuel industry runs a very, very significant campaign of disinformation and political obstruction around all this stuff. 
but they have not yet focused so much on the oceans issues. So there's a wider doorway, gateway for science to intrude <laughs> on their uh, propagandizing. Um, and then I think it's just, I think there is that human, I don't know what it is. I can't put a finger on why we have it, but I see it over and over again, even from people who live in square states, that there's just something different about the oceans. Yeah, well, we are a water planet. Uh, the work of the Senate Oceans Caucus. Uh, you, you, you use the caucus quite effectively. We do. Is this discuss these discussions, plastics, carbon sink, uh, marine mammals, the dependency on the oceans, I know they're a part of that, but is that a, can that be, are, are there ways that we, can, we outside of the caucus can work with the caucus or help amplify the work, inform the work? Uh, I guess, you know, what's, what would be the charge to a community like this in terms of the caucus, but also Congress in general? So a kind word on the um, Oceans Caucus, because I think it has been consequential. Uh, when I got to the Senate, I kept getting stuff from the International Conservation Caucus, which was supported by the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. And with the help of the foundation, they could do dinners and bring in people and have activities. I met then Prince Charles through an ICCF dinner and so forth. So I prevailed very quickly on the ICCF to give a try to opening up an OCF in, in tandem with its international conservation work. And they agreed to do that. And they rounded up a lot of Republican members. And it allows us to pre-vet legislation so that when it comes out with the support of the Oceans Caucus, we can go to the floor and say, you know, 20 Republicans supported this, all of whom are members of the Oceans Caucus Foundation. And I want to give a nice shout out to um, Lisa Murkowski, who is the co-founder and co-chair of it for the really good work that she's done to make sure that those folks get rounded up. Um, so I think both the ICCF and the OCF, both the International Conservation Caucus and the Oceans Caucus, are uh, highly effective um, bodies in the Senate, at least. They're what I call letterhead caucuses, where people join and put their name on the letterhead, and that's the last you hear of the caucus. Neither the International Conservation Caucus nor the Oceans Caucus are like that. We actually do things, and it's been very... Um, very useful. It's clear. Um, SOS 1, SOS 2, now SOS 3. What's your scorecard Fisheries on those? Bill. Fisheries bill. What's your scorecard on overall and then maybe connected to the Antarctic as well? Pretty good. I mean, uh, people ask me about this and I say you've got to appreciate the Senate as having kind of an issues terrain. And in the issues terrain, there are uh, open areas where you can operate in a bipartisan fashion. And then there are areas that basically are under the cloud of partisan or special interest influence, and it's just really hard to operate there. And we've been able to run really right up to the border of that shadow and get quite a lot done bipartisan. Uh, most of these bills passed by unanimous consent or with broad agreement in a must-pass piece of legislation, which means everybody got out of the way and let it happen in the Senate, which is not a thing that happens often. So, you know, it, it provides a good uh, runway, but like many runways, you can get so far and then you fall under the shadow of fossil fuel influence and it all shrivels up and <coughs> evaporates and dries up. But we do more to get closer into that boundary than I think any other group. You, you mentioned a, a list of, well, SOS3, but then a whole other pe pieces of legislation that they're being, you're being you are introducing with others. Um, can you just run through those again for a moment? I know you've got a hard stop here in a few minutes. And the reason I would like for you to do that, just connect the dots yeah. for us a little bit, because again, I'm trying to connect these to the Antarctic, but again, you can't separate the Antarctic from, from the globe. It's a, it's yeah. a driver, it's a critical driver. But for us to better understand how those nesting pieces of legislation, if they go through, what the cause and effect will be, and then how people like us can grab those, yeah. and then maybe work those through in the very areas that we particularly work in. Yeah. Not to be siloed, but work yeah. across. So done so far are the original Save Our Seas bill and Save Our Seas 2.0 and the Blue Globe bill, which is essentially a bill that supports measurement 
of what's going on in the ocean so we have more situational awareness. Uh, agreed to and awaiting Senate action is the uh, High Seas Fisheries Bill. Um, and I hope that we can move that forward. There's a process you have to go through. It has to go through committee to be eligible to be put into the National Defense Bill. Our target is the next NDAA. So, and Dan Sullivan sits on armed services and it's, you know, his bill. So I think we're in pretty good position to have an advocate in that committee for it. Uh, so that's going, I think, uh, pretty well. We are re rebooting a little bit and rebadging what we called the Blue Carbon Bill, which we could not get into that last NDAA, and that is uh, much more about supporting uh, the carbon sink function of the ocean. Um, and I think we'll be able to make progress on that. There's a lot in it that's very good, and um, as long as it's not too branded as a climate-related thing, then I, we need to, you know, skirt the, the borders of the shadowed area, and I think we can do that. Um, so those are the major ones that come to mind that we've got in, in queue right now. Perfect. Thank you. I'm watching the clock. That's all right. I'm still watching the clock. <laughs> uh, uh, it wasn't too long ago. If you said the word Arctic on the Hill, some, some members would, would get it. They, they understood yeah. where it was and, and, and the importance of it. Others would be very inquisitive about it. Uh, some others would have, have heard about, of course, the North and Alaska, but not quite know where the linkage is to their constituents uh, and, and the importance to our nation. I think because of the politics of the world, the Arctic has now emerged as a, as a very yes. important region for a lot of different reasons. Yes. So I think we're there on the, on the not education, but also the, the understanding of the importance of the region to the United States. Is that conversation equal to less than the Antarctic. Do you hear about the Antarctic in a way that you hear now about the Arctic? Not as much. First of all, we have Arctic states like Alaska, um, and there's a whole Arctic Council that works on Arctic issues, and we have the shipping channels that are opening up as the Arctic melts. So that creates big opportunities for Chinese shipping, including potentially naval uh, intrusions that weren't possible before because of the ice. And you see, although their military has been pretty well chewed up in uh, Ukraine, you see the Russians investing a lot in Antarctic facilities and ice-breaking ships and so forth. So you put all that together and there's a whole lot of reason for people to be interested. I think China is probably the dominant interesting part on the Arctic and what it means to have the Chinese using that as a trade route to Europe. Um, Antarctica much less so. We're not, we're nowhere near it. And so what we're seeing is the secondary effects of, of the sea level rise and the fisheries damage and things like that. Um, you mentioned plastics before, and you're right. Marine, terrestrial, atmospheric, it, plastics are us, unfortunately. 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 Uh, Maybe, maybe use your last few minutes here to talk a little bit more about that, because what I, what I see is that there are more and more conferences and, and international discussions about plastics yeah. writ large, um, and showing up in places that people think are quote unquote pristine, I think has, has alarmed some, yeah. uh, and, and we have to advance our understanding, but also advance how we address this. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, plastics. Perhaps you can talk a little bit more about the work being done there. Uh, because it's not a niche issue. It is now embedded in our global set of issues. It is, and I think the, um, the best work at this point is likely to come out of the UN treaty process, kicked off by, I thought, a very good starting agreement in Nairobi, sort of framing out the process. Um, we'll see how far we can get with 3.0, um, but I think that you know, getting international concordance around this is a very big deal. And so I'm watching the UN effort very, very closely. We're also seeing uh, European plastics companies showing a lot more responsibility about their product than American companies do. Uh, I was at the Oslo 
Oceans Conference when Unilever announced a plan to remove from the world uh, a kilo of plastic waste for every kilo of plastic that it put out into the world in packaging or in materials that it uh, produced. When it does that, and I think we're pretty close to the deadline for that going live, that does one very significant thing. You can't go find that much plastic. Mm -hmm. You've got to buy it. And you've got to then have a supply chain for waste plastic that has some uh, accountability to it. And so that creates some organizational structure so that in places where there's a lot of ocean plastic waste, it now becomes in somebody's interest to pay to have that removed in an orderly fashion and disposed of in a proper way, as opposed to having it be free to pollute, free to dump, and nobody's responsible for the cleanup. We can all agree and we can all talk quite a lot about climate change, and we can all agree and we can all talk a lot about plastic pollution, but if the economic signal into our world economy is that the expensive thing to do is to clean up, and the a less expensive thing to do is to continue polluting, you know what the result is going to be. So it's going to be, I think, really important for the UN Treaty and for perhaps these carbon tariffs in each of these two issues, plastics and climate, to raise the bar so that the companies that want to do the right thing are no longer putting themselves into competitive disadvantage against companies that de facto want to cheat. You have to lift the bar with, I hope, the support of the better behaving companies so that the cheaters don't profit. And then, of course, we all benefit from uh, less plastic and less carbon pollution in the air. Thank you. Uh, you have championed the oceans writ large in a bipartisan manner, Senator Sullivan with Senator Murkowski and other senators. Yeah. Uh, and, and it seems to me that that that, well, it is the only way forward on these very complex issues surrounding our environment, our globe, but these interconnected pieces, what we've been talking about here today, the Arctic, the Antarctic, uh, and ra elevating the issues of the Antarctic, which in fact elevate the issues of the rest of the globe. They, yeah. they are very common. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for all of that, because I think at this time when we face so many challenges, to have members of Congress working in a bipartisan way to advance legislation that makes the planet better, but guides, whether it's foreign policy work, whatever the work it is that this, this group of colleagues uh, are advance, it, it's helpful to us to hear that. It's appreciated. I want to give you a final opportunity to help us think through. You just can't get away from the geopolitics here. So help think through how we navigate now this new Antarctic, how we navigate geopolitically, environmentally, socially, this new region that seems to be opening, whether it's figuratively or literally connected to your work. I guess the thing that I would point out is that um, there is considerable anxiety throughout Congress about China. And one piece that I think provides a real opportunity for bipartisanship is trying to confront and manage both the depredations of the Chinese fishing fleet and the depredations of other pirate fishing fleets uh, in the high seas. And I think a lot of the Antarctica waters count as high seas in the Ross Sea and places like that. So. Um, I think there's a, a, a pretty solid political lane to come together, and I think that's why Dan is such an enthusiastic proponent of the fisheries bill, to come together and, and, and put some real pressure against that kind of uh, behavior. Um, and the Antarctic, just because of its nature, is a sort of theme park for testing our ability to protect those areas. Um, and significantly, it's also a very, very significant alarm bell and, or bellwether, whatever you want to call it, that as things go in the Antarctic, so they go along our shores. And um, we need to be extremely watchful and alert. 
Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll save the other 20 plus questions for, an, for another session. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, Good. please thank Senator Thanks Sheldon for having Hale. me. Senator, as always. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse and Dr. Sofrega. Thank you, audience. We will now take a 20-minute health break and reconvene at 3.20 for our final panel of the day on climate change in Antarctica. Thank you. At 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, it feels like we should have more than 20 minutes, but we need to get going. And I... Um, I'm really excited about our final panel of the day. I'm, I'm delighted to introduce them, and I'm really looking forward to their interventions. Um, our final panel is on Antarctic ice, ocean circulation, polar satellites, and global climate. And in many ways, it's a culmination of a lot of the things that we've heard about today in sort of bits and bobs here and there. We have an outstanding lineup of Antarctic scientists who are going to close us out today with a deep dive on these topics. I'm grateful to them for being here today, um, and uh, I'll introduce them very briefly and let the panel kick off. We have Dr. Ted Scambos from the University of Colorado's Earth Science and Observation Center, Dr. Heather Lynch from Stony Brook, Stony Brook University, and Dr. Sharon Stammerjohn from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, Dr. Hila Levy from OSTP and the National Security Council will be guiding this discussion. Um, she's well placed to do so given her position at the intersection of science policy and public policy. Um, and without further ado, our science panel, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Becca. And it's such an honor to be able to share the stage with these distinguished scientists. Usually you have to travel to uh, a very big, bustling scientific convention um, to get this caliber of talk. Uh, so we're really excited to be able to share with you some of the latest and most cutting edge science distilled, not for a scientific audience, but distilled for all of our viewers online and here in person. And I think it's really wonderful that we'll be able to see some of our top science communicators really bring to life the climate crisis and the issues that, uh, that we have facing us. So, and it's a real pleasure as an Antarctic scientist in my past to be able to come and, and relive, uh, relive that work through all of you. So I think what we'd like to do is to get started and I will turn it over to Dr. Heather Lynch. Um, who has some slides that she'll share with us so that we can hear a little bit about the large-scale ecological impacts um, occurring on the Antarctic continent and Southern Ocean. Terrific. Well, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here and kick off this panel. And in doing so, I won't have time to get into much detail about the, how the Southern Ocean ecosystem functions, except to introduce its heavy hitter here, Antarctic krill, which you've already heard quite a bit about. Um, pretty much all the large animals in Antarctica either eat krill or eat something that eat krill. It, what, it's what we would call a keystone species in the Southern Ocean. And importantly, it can be found in these vast underwater swarms um, with sort of miles of nothingness between. It's extremely patchy. And these krill, while they can swim up and down into the water column, otherwise are sort of passive drifters um, being moved around by the currents of the ocean in ways that we're still trying to understand. What we know for sure is that this uh, patchy but abundant krill resource supports an almost unimaginable abundance of life at the surface, as illustrated by this penguin colony here, which if you could see all of it, um, you would believe that there are almost a million breeding pairs of penguins on this island alone. And that's not unusual. In fact, while we have almost, you know, over 900 penguin colonies around Antarctica, when we think about the ones that are really driving global abundance, there's only about a dozen colonies um, that are comparable to this that are really driving the abundance and distribution and the trends that we see in global uh, uh, you know, under global change. Now, unfortunately, these are also the most remote, the most difficult, the most logistically uh, challenging to access. And so you can see that the traditional method of monitoring these colonies, which is to say counting penguin heads one by one, is simply not going to work. But we have a lot of new technologies that we can throw at this problem now. And in particular, I want to highlight the role of satellites and drones in really revolutionizing the way we study Antarctic wildlife. Um, in the case of penguins, um, though each individual, 
I should say the highest resolution satellites that we have available for this kind of work is 31 centimeters on a side, which means we can see everything that's about the size of a piece of paper or larger. And certainly that includes the whales and the seals where we can both see them from space and enumerate them individually. When it comes to penguins and other seabirds, we have to use a bit of a trick, which is that we see the guano stain or the excrement actually that the penguins and seabirds are leaving behind. But it turns out that's all we need because we can work back to roughly how many penguins are in uh, each of those areas. And this provides a means of actually surveying the entire coast of Antarctica um, every year and monitoring these populations in ways almost unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. Now, this allows us to do biology over 12 orders of magnitude. And I'll just play this short video to show you what that really uh, means. So we can, as I mentioned, we can survey uh, wildlife at the scale of the entire continent, but we can also zoom into areas of particular biological importance, like the danger islands I'm showing you here. Um, the danger islands uh, is an area that is a biological hotspot that was only discovered to be a biological hotspot in satellite imagery. And zooming in even further and combining that with drone imagery, we can see exactly where the penguins are on the landscape one by one. And of course, coupling that with the field work that we do in Antarctica, we can get at behavior and biology and natural history and diet. So by using traditional field uh, methods with drones and also satellites, we can couple together the mechanisms that are occurring at this scale um, with the patterns that we're seeing at the continental scale. What this allows us to do is answer the question that I got from National Geographic a few years ago, how many penguins are there on the Antarctic Peninsula and how have their populations changed over time? Now, if I had gotten that question when I started at Stony Brook University, that would have been an entire PhD dissertation. But given the advances that we have now with satellites and drones and computer vision, AI, advanced statistical modeling, I was able to give them the data that ultimately ended up in this graphic in a matter of minutes. And so we've really come a long way towards achieving this kind of real-time streaming data set at the continental scale that allows us to see how the biology is changing, not just how uh, the environmental conditions are changing, as my co-panelists will talk about later. What are we finding? Well, among many things that we're finding that the chinstrap penguins, um, which have long been sort of left out of the conversation of climate change's impacts, are declining rapidly and in some areas by 80% or more. And unlike the Adelie penguin, which is also suffering from climate change on the Antarctic Peninsula, the uh, chinstrap penguin has no refugia. There are no parts of its range actually where it appears to be um, stable or growing. And so these declines that we're seeing are both kind of shocking, but also not, not buffered um, by growth elsewhere. And it's already been mentioned that these recent findings um, that have been reported on how extremely low sea ice led to a catastrophic loss of emperor penguin chicks. And this against a sort of a backdrop of concern that emperor penguins will be one of the most seriously affected by climate change in the future. So what do we, what do, we do with this? You know, do we just sort of run around and panic that all the penguins are going to go extinct? And I think that's the wrong way to think about these data. We're not, at least I'm not, speaking for myself, studying penguins to study penguins. What we're using is penguins as a measure of how the Southern Ocean is functioning. And that way, I like to think about this analogy here. If you go for your annual physical and your, blood or your doctor orders all these blood tests, and he or she comes back and says, OK, I'm a little concerned because your red blood cells are high, they're not necessarily worried that your red blood cell counts are high. What they're worried about is that there's been some sort of change in the physiology um, that is causing that, and they'd really like to get to the root of it, because it might have a trivial reason, but it could also mean that there's a serious disease that they'd like to understand better. And so I think of the data that we collect, not just on penguins, but on seals and whales, um, particularly now that we're able to do so sort of at the continental scale, um, as being like this annual checkup. And what we're finding is that there really is something changing about the physiology of the Southern Ocean. It's changing in important and sort of structural ways, and that's being reflected in all the data that we're seeing across the board. All of our markers now would be considered out of range, and that's because um, we do have a, a, a dysfunctional um, uh, physiology. And finally, I'll just say that while we tend to focus on the threat of climate change, which is slow moving, 
on the scale of things and also chronic, we can't forget that there will be other stressors that hit the Antarctic environment. And here I'd like to reiterate something that was mentioned earlier in Cassandra's talk, which is a highly pathogenic avian influenza, which made it to the tip of South America in April and will very likely appear in the Antarctic this year. Um, avian flu, as it's known, has had devastating consequences to seabirds globally. And it's really a matter of when, but not if it, it does um, become carried into the Antarctic. And that could have really devastating consequences for the wildlife that, as I've mentioned, is already um, in a weakened state due to these long running changes due to environmental change. Um, so with that, I will um, pass it off to my uh, co-panelist, Sharon Stammerjohn. Thank you so much, Heather. And they say you can't smell a picture, but um, I definitely am thinking back to my guano scooping days when I see all those penguins. <laughs> Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Sharon. Uh, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Great to be engaged in this really exciting conference and in this discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about, largely, I'm going to talk about Antarctic sea ice. And as we all have heard, it has changed pretty dramatically lately. So I'm going to step through this process pretty quickly um, and really kind of highlight some key points that have been highlighted throughout the day, which is really kind of exciting. So this is first year, this is very early season sea ice. And it's something that we call pancake ice or some version thereof. And it's a very typical ice type in the outer sea ice zone of Antarctica or the Southern Ocean because the Southern Ocean is one of the windiest and waviest um, areas on the planet. And this type of sea ice is what forms under high winds and waves. And so this would be your early season snapshot. So for sea ice scientists, it's really critical to have access to ice strengthened vessels, to ice breakers, to get to the sea ice zone that is of interest. And so we use here the Nathaniel B. Palmer. We also have used the, um, the Gould and other ice breakers from other collaborating, collaborating countries. And we would like to access this sea ice zone in both summer and winter because there's some really key processes that are very linked to the overlying atmosphere and the underlying ocean. It's a very strongly coupled process that has global implications that we're going to walk through. So yes, although we get very thin sea ice that grows thermodynamically in the Southern Ocean and only grows so much because there's this heat source deep below called the circumpolar deep water that limits the amount of sea ice you can grow in C2. It's very unlike the Arctic, which where you can grow much thicker ice. It's also unlike some of the very uh, Southern coastal regions of, of Antarctica where you don't have that key source so prevalent. But it really distinguishes the Southern Ocean and plays a key role in its um, interactions with the atmosphere and ocean and its implications for global climate. But come summer, because it's a very windy, wavy environment, you can get very thick sea ice piling up in the coastal regions. Another um, challenge for us, because we really need strong icebreakers to access these regions to study these really key processes. And you can find yourself in some very deep snow and sea ice in the Southern Ocean. So these sea ice studies are also very important because they not only are looking at the processes that are coupling the atmosphere and the ocean that drive our global climate, but they also serve as validation, really important validation for satellite. And so now we're going to look at some satellite data. We're going to zoom out and look at how, um, first of all, you all have seen this, but this is just showing you an animation for one winter season into summer into the following winter of how that happens in the Southern Ocean. And so you have this pretty rapid melt back and this slow um, growth. And so that slow growth is again, mostly thermodynamically driven. That melt back is really assisted by these high winds and waves. You can kind of consider this as the heartbeat of the global climate. At least I like to consider it that way because of how strongly linked it is to the overlying atmosphere and the underlying ocean that drives the ocean circulation that is critical for the Southern Ocean's outsized role in taking up anthropogenic heat and CO2. And you've heard all these bullet points throughout the day. And it's because of this seasonal cycle where we have great sea ice production going on in our coastal regions, much of that then melts offshore. And so you have um, 
strong interactions with the ocean and water transformation that is important to the meridional overturning circulation. So how has sea ice changed? You all know this, and I'm just going to walk through this really quickly. So this is a time series of the sea ice extent anomalies since the beginning of continuous satellite observations in the late 1970s. Reds are, of course, uh, below average sea ice extent, and blues are above. And over this 30-year period, almost 40 years we're approaching, you see this overall tendency to more blues. And in fact, we came to some record high sea ice extents in 2015. And, it, and in a spatial sense, what that looked like, and what I'm showing you here is an um, anomaly map of ice season duration. And the blues show much longer ice seasons. So we had long ice seasons and very high sea ice extent. And then quite suddenly, we went to 2016, 2017, and we got record low sea ice extent. And that looked like largely in the reds, very short sea ice seasons. This is really critical to the ecosystems that Heller was just talking about. It's also very critical to the land margins because sea ice is a buffer um, to ocean uh, glacial ice interactions in addition to modifying ocean ice shelf interactions. So following that 2016, 2017, which shocked us because it was really sudden and quite dramatic, Low sea ice persisted, and that, that was quite perplexing. But then it gradually showed some, some recovery by 2021, only to reach now all-time all record lows in 22 and 23. And if we look at a spatial map of what those anomalies look like, pretty much everywhere we have shorter ice seasons. And so why is this happening? OK, already you can see this is only a 40-year record plus a few years. We have very distinct multi-decadal variability in the Southern Ocean. It's very sensitive <laughs> to tropical and a variability to long time scales. So there's a lot of variability and it challenges us because our records are fairly short. But what we do know is that there's a lot of heat in the ocean and this was already talked about earlier. But this is just showing you an anomaly map now with the lighter reds and, and lighter blues are SST anomalies. And so all that red are warmer surface water temperatures um, than usual. And those are quite aligned with the sea ice concentration anomalies, which are shown in the darker reds. And so what we're seeing are, are these preferential areas of ocean heat intruding southward. And this is very, uh, this is work that's in progress right now. We, these areas look like they're quite aligned with oceanic bathymetric ridges where there's some um, a known upwelling and ocean mixing that occurs that breaks that what we call the zonal barrier so that it can intrude heat southward. And this was also talked to, and this is the ocean heat content anomalies since the 1950s. And we just see, you know, the, the increase, in fact, the exponential increase in ocean heat content in the 1990s to the uh, to present day. And what's amazing, we've talked about this too, is that it, the global oceans are responsible for taking up about 90% plus or minus of the anthropogenic heat, that heat that results from the increase in carbon emissions. That's 90%. The global oceans have been doing us a favor. If it weren't for that aspect of absorbing, taking up heat, and I should say CO2, this planet would be a lot warmer and, and far less sustainable. If we break that down regionally, the Southern Ocean, again, plays an outsized role. It actually was responsible for 60 to 70% of, of that global anthropogen, anthropogenic heat uptake. So the, the take home here is sea ice has dramatically changed. It's the heartbeat of this global ocean circulation, atmospheric circulation that's responsible for taking up this heat and this CO2. And it's changing quite rapidly. And it also has pretty significant uh, implications for glaciology. And that's what Ted's going to talk about. Thank you so much, Sharon. Looking forward to hearing from Dr. Ted Scambos now. Well, thanks, every let's get closer. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Wilson Center for inviting uh, me, us, um, and uh, my fellow panelists. 
Um, yeah, I want to talk about sort of the, the ultimate uh, southern ice um, area, the ice sheet itself. And following on from what Sharon just presented, uh, we've been kicking the Southern Ocean around for a long time, and frankly, the Southern Ocean is about to get even. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the area you see here is right in front of Thwaites Glacier, one of the major outlet glaciers in Antarctica. It's accelerating, and it's being influenced by warm water at depth that's eroding the ice near the coast, causing the ice to flow out faster. Unfortunately, this particular glacier has access to a whole lot of ice within the interior of the ice sheet, and that means that it could have a significant impact all by itself. One massive glacier, but one glacier uh, in Antarctica could raise sea level about two feet by itself, but because of its position in the Antarctic ice sheet, will probably drag in another two meters to three meters of sea level rise um, over the next few centuries if things continue on the path they're on. One thing I wanted to point out, this is a map of elevation change over the first two decades of, of this century. All of the red areas are losing elevation. Uh, the scales are different, so the fact that there's a pale blue over so much of East Antarctica means that it's getting thicker by just a few centimeters, whereas the darker red areas are losing elevation on the scale of meters uh, per year. Um, uh, and, and therefore, the net balance of Antarctica, as I mentioned before, is around 100 to 150 billion tons of ice added to the ocean every year, net added to the ocean every year. Uh, every one of those red areas could be important in the future. And one of the points I wanted to make with this slide is that we as scientists need access, we as a nation need access to the coast of Antarctica and the interior of Antarctica for research because these areas are going to become important for our own coastal security in the future and uh, will become increasingly important in the decades to come. We're going to want to be there. The public is going to ask for us to understand these things on their behalf. This is another view of Thwaites Glacier. This is the sort of fastest part of the outlet, the, the, the center of it. And you can see it flowing very rapidly, breaking up. That's right at the point where it goes afloat, breaks up into large fragments, which later melt further out into the ocean. The point is that the mass flux into the ocean, that's where sea level rise happens. The melting of the icebergs eventually doesn't add to sea level rise. It's already contributed the amount of sea level rise that it's going to contribute as the point that it flows into the ocean, um, and in particular, faster, more volume flowing into the ocean than falls as snow on the surface of the continent. This is from the latest IPCC report, and it shows the sea level rise curve models for um, several scenarios in the future. But there's one flyer riding across the top of all of them, the dotted line, and that has to do with the potential, mostly that Antarctica, a little bit Greenland, but mostly Antarctica has to influence sea level rise in ways that are difficult to model, difficult to predict, need more study. And so that uh, line there at the top uh, indicates that we could see up to a meter additional sea level rise if things go very badly in Antarctica. And so far, they show no sign of really slowing down. Um, at the top there, I put some of the sea level rise rates, currently about three to four, uh, excuse me, millimeters per year. <clears throat> By the end of the century, six to 30 millimeters per year. And of course, if you talk to New York City or San Francisco or New Orleans or Houston, uh, 30 millimeters per year is a scary, scary number for them. And the level of infrastructure rebuilding to preserve the cities will be uh, huge in terms of cost. I wanted to show you a little bit about why Thwaites and this particular coast of West Antarctica is so important, so unstable for sea level rise. Uh, you can see that the ice sheet is all nice and white and smooth there, a uh, peninsula off to the left side. But if you take away the ice, you can see that there are very deep basins upstream of the outlet glaciers in this part of Antarctica. So as the ice begins to retreat, it retreats into thicker ice. Thicker ice means more driving stress. It, it, it flows under its own weight, as we learned in high school. And uh, because there's more thickness, there's more weight, it flows out faster as a result. If you back away from the coast, and all of those glaciers are doing that now, currently not very fast, but they're doing it, you get into thicker ice in the interior that leads to a runaway process of unloading the ice from the continent of Antarctica and raising sea level. Why? I said that the Southern Ocean was going to get even. And what's happening is that because of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we're changing the wind patterns around the continent. We're increasing the westerly wind pattern around 
the continent, and that is causing the surface of the ocean to be pushed around in different ways. That allows the deeper ocean to move in closer to Antarctica, and in particular in this area, uh, I called it Pine Island Bay, or sometimes you'll hear Amundsen Sea embayment. <clears throat> that area is seeing melting at depth. To a lesser extent, we're seeing lots of change in the Antarctic Peninsula because winds blowing across the peninsula produce these Chinook wind effects that lead to a lot of melting and, and puddling of water on the surface and breakup of ice shelves there. A much bigger problem um, that we've come to realize is that deeper, warmer seawater is now pushing into the continent of Antarctica, reaching the deeper, thicker glaciers along the coast, causing them to melt at their base more rapidly and therefore flow out faster. I just wanted to show that uh, something that um, uh, Sharon talked about already, but I just wanted to show you the loneliness of the current sea level, excuse me, sea ice extent line. That blue line is the line of sea ice extent that's been, um, um, yeah, uh, evolving all year from a record low in uh, late February and a record low maximum just a few days ago. Something has happened in the Southern Ocean where the surface waters now have a little bit more heat than they used to. Sharon showed the current um, hypothesis, uh, it's working theory that we have. I mean, it's, it's, it's unpublished, but it's coming together fairly nicely that what we're seeing is uh, warmer ocean water around the perimeter of Antarctica. And the global oceans are at record high temperatures right now. Anyway, that, that some of that heat is now getting stirred into the upper ocean layer around Antarctica and making it harder for the ocean water to cool off to the point where you form sea ice on the surface. And I think, right, I wanted to point out that there are uh, a kind of ice, what we call landfast ice, that actually forms along the coast of Antarctica. So you have the sea ice as sort of a flexible, broken up, protective um, skirt around the continent. Wave action is uh, damped uh, considerably as uh, you reach this uh, floating pack ice. Then you get to areas in the coast where it's a little bit calmer and that actually congeals into a solid plate of ice. And that also, can be flexed by wave action, but it doesn't often feel any wave action because there's sea ice out there that's dampening the waves around the continent. If that fast ice uh, is um, exposed to wave action from the Southern Ocean, it can break apart fairly rapidly and it can cause some acceleration of the glaciers behind it. So in addition to the mechanism of warm ocean water at depth eroding the underside of the glaciers, if we lose the sea ice around Antarctica, we'll expose a lot of the coastline to wave action that flexes this frozen ice on the surface, fairly thin frozen ice, and breaks it apart, which further exposes thicker ice behind it and may cause some erosion of the Antarctic continental ice. Um, so with all of that good news, <coughs> I'll leave you with a nice picture of Antarctica and we'll uh, take any questions that you have. I, mean, I am optimistic that we can solve this issue. Uh, economically, it makes sense to go after uh, greenhouse gases. You can see it in the way people are advertising now and what they say and what they do about the future. But we really need to, uh, <clears throat> it's a bad metaphor, we need to put our pedal to the metal in terms of uh, getting on it. So um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, I'm going to, I think we have quite enough time to be able to tackle some audience questions, but I'm going to kick us off with some moderator's privilege to ask a couple of questions and, and maybe help further elucidate and, and make sure we really get the message out there about um, what the changes are that are happening in Antarctica and how that really affects us globally. Um, if I may, we, we've heard a lot about the sea ice and the direct effects as well as the, the sink that the ocean serves in terms of heat energy and the temperature of the rising ocean. Um, we're also seeing air temperatures increase and hi our highest ever air temperatures, especially on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is an area I know that um, Dr. Lynch and I have both worked on. And I'm curious, Heather, if you could tell us a little bit about how you see those air temperature increases affecting um, the local environments and what the wider ramifications are for the ecosystem? Yeah, no, it's a great question because we tend not to think as much about air temperatures. Um, uh, one of the big impacts that we're seeing is that, you know, at, at 31 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, 
Uh, it's snowing, and at 32 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to be raining. And it's just a tiny difference on the thermometer, but from a penguin's perspective, this is this is night and day and can be absolutely catastrophic, particularly when you have chicks that are in their downy plumage and they don't yet have their adult feathers that make them waterproof. And so a heavy rain when you have chicks um, that are exposed, they're too big to be tucked in the nest, but they're not yet in their adult plumage can, can be absolutely devastating. And I've sat there and watched a chick freeze to death before my very eyes. Um, because it got wet and it just wasn't able to keep warm. And so you can get these catastrophic events for, you know, it's like the the, the tipping point in the canoe uh, metaphor where just a small increase, particularly on the Antarctic Peninsula, where we're going from a really snow-dominated ecosystem to a rain-dominated ecosystem. And I'll just say that I used to, I travel on cruise ships um, as my primary platform for research, and I will um, have people you know, interested in the impacts of climate change. And I would say, oh, well, it's not like, you know, the penguins just keel over from the heat. It's more complicated. And then I sort of, you know, give them this whole story. But I just came back from the International Penguin Conference, and there was uh, a poster there um, laying out some really interesting camera trap data from the Falkland Islands um, uh, showing that uh, gentoo penguin chicks um, you know, they, they can pant for a couple of hours and then they do literally keel over. Like they hit their thermodynamic maximum now with the temperatures that they're seeing in the Falkland Islands. And that's not, you know, out of scope that we might start to see that on the Antarctic Peninsula. So um, here I am, you know, eating humble pie that in fact, um, you know, while mostly we think of the impacts on the ecosystem, you know, there are physical limits to what these uh, organisms can withstand. And they're starting to hit those uh, physical limits, um, unfortunately, more and more frequently. Thank you so much. And uh, globally right now, we're entering into a period where we're quite likely, it's almost quite certain, that we'll be entering into an El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, which tends to peak around the winter time, the months that we're entering. And so a lot of countries, a lot, you know, we have our NOAA really on watch monitoring with worldwide meteorological organizations to think about how those changes will really affect um, all of us and, and our food systems and, and the whole world. And I'm curious, um, Dr. Samarjan, if you could maybe elaborate on what you think this emerging period we're entering into where we might see some temperature spikes globally that will be out of range. What what impact might that have on Antarctica? That's a great question, and um, the beauty that the beauty of the Southern Ocean is that, and, and uh, Antarctica is that you have this continent and this vast ocean um, surrounding it, and it's very sensitive to tropical climate variability, and it's even sensitive to North Pacific and North Atlantic climate variability. So we see a very clean, strong ENSO signal in, in Antarctic sea ice, for example, and, and shifting um, atmospheric circulation patterns and temperature. And sure enough, we know exactly what an El Nino looks like um, in the Southern Ocean. So an El Nino will normally um, be very uh, impactful to the whole Southeast Pacific portion, so off of waste. Um, that portion of Antarctica, but it has circumpolar effects, but that's where you see the strongest signal. And so you get very strong regional contrasts. So if the, the interesting thing about that, and we saw these strong regional contrasts throughout the first 20, 30 years in a trend map, and now as you saw in those anomalies, we're now just widespread low sea ice, right? So we're, we lost that regional contrast. This is to say, we didn't lose ENSO. ENSO is still happening, but there's been a fundamental shift, or at least evidence for that, that even despite these strong swings that are associated with natural climate variability like ENSO, um, we're still seeing this very pronounced change. Now, yes, we're gonna have warmer global temperatures associated with this El Nino. We just came out of a persistent couple year La Nina, which was great because what happens in a La Nina? You actually absorb more atmospheric heat. And so it was buffering our global climate, but it was not buffering the Antarctic. In fact, it intensified a low pressure system called the Amundsen Sea Low, which just destroyed, you know, the Southeast Pacific and Southwest Pacific, actually. For sea ice cover. For sea ice cover, but also ice shelf ocean interactions and uh, the upwelling of circumpolar deep water. So we'll get a break from that with the El Nino, but what we won't get a break from is the warmer temperatures bring moisture, bring more rain. And what I found completely heartbreaking besides the rain that's happening on the peninsula is I was in the Amundsen Sea just two years ago at 75 degrees south and it rained. 
And rain is like, put that on snow, put that on ice, put that on a glacier, and you're going to melt that much faster. So that was pretty shocking, I have to say. <laughs> Speaking of shocks, um, Dr. Scambos, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what we might foresee um, in terms of sea level rise. So sea level rise, could you maybe explain a little bit about whether that will be felt uniformly across across the globe or whether there might be differences that we should be considering from a policy perspective, from an adaptation perspective, yeah. based on your research? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, great question. And in fact, uh, that's the one slide I thought I should have put that in and, uh, and didn't, so you really gave me a great opportunity. <laughs> it is a little tough to explain uh, because uh, adding ice to the ocean from either the Great Ice Sheets, Greenland or Antarctica, is not like adding water to a bathtub where it goes up evenly. And that's because of the incredible amount of mass that's stored on these ice sheets, and in particular in Antarctica in this case. In Antarctica, because there's a tremendous amount, trillions of tons of ice eventually would flow into the ocean, you lose mass from the side of the continent. And that means that the ocean water surface isn't pulled as much towards the coastline as it used to be. So there's a, a lower gravitational pull in that area. The ocean sort of relaxes away from the continent. The areas that are most impacted by loss of ice from the Antarctic ice sheet are the coasts of the United States and Northern Europe. Those are the ones that get the biggest effects, and Northern China and, and Japan as well. We have a vested interest in understanding what sea level rise will look like from the Antarctic because it's our coastlines that will see 30% or so more sea level rise than other areas. Ironically, in the vicinity of the Antarctic, sea level actually goes down there are papers that talk about the mitigating effect of that lowering sea level on the glaciers. They hit bottom a little bit harder, so they grind a little bit more. It's not enough to stop the runaway process that I was talking about, where faster flow happens as you get into the thicker ice. But it is a factor in terms of slowing it down. Overall, if ice loss happens mostly from Antarctica, the places that see the greatest impact of sea level rise are the coasts of the US and Northern Europe. Now, if you factor in Greenland and Antarctica together, then it's tropical areas that see uh, the worst impacts. And the Gulf Coast suffers quite considerably of our nation, but also the smaller islands throughout the Pacific, the whole tropical band. If Antarctica leads the way to that extent that it does, then the northern hemisphere sees slightly more sea level rise than the world average. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I think we'll turn to audience questions, if anyone has hands. Yes, Tony. Um, <clears throat> Tony Press. Uh, I, I'm going to use the um, term tipping points. Um, how uh, the, the, the sea ice in particular um, concerns me greatly because I, I see the consequences of that um, to not only mass balance of the continent itself and the, the loss of glaciers, but also the, the um, effects on the whole of the Southern Ocean ecosystem. Are we brave enough to say we're at a tipping point now? I'm, it's it's <coughs> something that, that um, has been churning in my mind for the last three months. Uh, That's a question to the, to, to the whole panel. Okay, you guys want to go? No, 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 go ahead, <laughs> Sharon, lead the way. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> Indeed, um, we are so tempted to, well, we, we also have that question. And there's no doubt that, as I was saying before, the Southern Ocean is very sensitive to, and, and Antarctic states is also a very sensitive um, responder to climate variability and climate change, and it's also a great influencer. So. And I mentioned we don't have very long time series to tease out the natural variability from the anthropogenic signal, but a paper just recently came out and it's very closely related to the follow-on paper I introduced in, with one of those slides and Ted mentioned, but this, this is by Puritan Dottridge and it just came out about a month and a half ago. 
And I had a slide on it, which I didn't show, but I could show if you want. But anyway, what it shows is that it uses the Argo float data, which is so key. We, this is great ocean data, because what I didn't mention is we don't have a lot of ocean data in the seasonal sea ice zone, particularly near the coast, where these processes are so important. And that data shows for the last 20 years um, that you went from in, in step with the sea ice changes. With high sea ice, you had cooler ocean temperatures to depth, well, the upper... Um, 100 meters 100, or so. No, it was even more deeper than that, 200. And then you shift to that very low sea ice. Um, in 2016, that persisted, a little bit of recovery, and then you know, took another dive, and you had very warm temperatures. And so how did those warm temperatures get there? And other work that our colleagues are doing uh, have lengthened that time series with Levitus ocean data. So not quite as robust as the Argo float data, but they also paint a very similar picture and really point to the multi-decadal variability in the upper ocean. So you have these cool and warm periods quite naturally, but you never see this pronounced shift that we just saw. And so the working hypothesis is that meanwhile, there's this global ocean heat that's knocking at the door of the southern ocean of the sea ice zone. And we have been lucky that the atmospheric circulation was such that it was creating a barrier to that southward intrusion, both of atmospheric heat and ocean heat. And we can go into the dynamics of that, but that is breaking down. And it could be because there's so much heat in the system. I mentioned the bathymetric ridges, and it almost looks like the heat is spilling over these um, areas, and, and that's, the signal's quite clear, right? So that's one mechanism to get heat southward. But I just look at that, you know, that trend in ocean heat content, and, and to me it's like, how, how, could we, how could it not be affected? And how could we not be kind of crossing a tipping yeah. point? Yeah. But there is good news. Nope. <laughs> and if we were to curb our carbon emissions and go to net zero, the ocean will respond accordingly, and it will continue its role of absorbing a lot of that extra heat that is residual in the atmosphere, because we know we can turn off our carbon emissions tomorrow, but of course, you know, there's a lifetime to these greenhouse gases, but the oceans will continue to work for us. So there it really is immediate, that's there's a, potentially an immediate response that could really help. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah, um, sea ice has been the most impacted in the Arctic. Now we're seeing big impacts in the Antarctic. It's also the system that's most likely to recover in terms of the polar systems. Um, I agree with Sharon. I will just add something that she would add also. Uh, we've always seen that Antarctic sea ice is highly variable. It's likely to continue to be highly variable, but the downturn since 2016, although there was that brief halfway recovery, uh, has been quite dramatic. And the change in the heat content that um, Arian Purich and uh, Eugene Dottridge, anyway, uh, Dottridge showed in their paper is also quite dramatic. Uh, I'm leaning towards this is a, a, a long-term change in the Southern Ocean until, until we do something about it. I'll take this question over here, and then Becca. Hi, Ken Boda. Uh, question for you. I know um, you get the deep water production in the Weddell Sea and, and, the, and the Ross Sea in those regions. Uh, you're getting a lot of meltwater coming in, increase or decreasing the salinity. Um, how, do you see that change in the uh, in the overturning circulation through the Antarctic and the Antarctic bottom water formation? You want to go? No, go ahead. <laughs> that is a great question. And, and, and why I don't we talk about acidification along with salinity changes, yeah, too? Yeah. <laughs> why not? <laughs> Do you want to start? No, 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 please. <laughs> so, yes, um, that high CS production that we normally get at the coastal region um, is responsible for the production of high salinity shelf water, which is the precursor to Antarctic bottom water. So that's the lower limb, the absolute um, deepest, lowest limb of our meridional overturning circulation. Do you remember that graph that Cassandra showed where you have the Antarctic in the middle and it's like a flywheel, you know, for the ocean, global ocean circulation with upper limbs, lower limbs. It all gets exchanged in the Southern Ocean through sea ice processes, through coupled right air-sea ice interactions. And so how does that happen? Because you get Antarctic bottom water production near the coast, that's your lower limb, 
And that sea ice is, is growing at the coast, but it gets transported offshore j just from expansion, but also from wind-driven advection off the coast from catabatic winds and you know, preferential areas. But you get a net melt equatorward or, or offshore, which then is the precursor to intermediate mode waters. It's also responsible for taking up that heat and CO2 which is going to lead to acidification. So if you don't have that, what I call the, the heartbeat of <laughs> Antarctic sea ice or that sea ice pump, it's also been called, you are weakening the meridional overturning circulation. And we are seeing evidence of that. And, and, and yet there's a bit of variability. Our observations aren't that long, but it's pretty consistent with everything else that we've been painting. Yeah. It, it would take a long time for the meridian overturning to really uh, come to a halt, radically change. I mean, this circulation clock is centuries in terms of time, but but it's slowing down, and that has to do with warming and less sea ice around the formation around the coast of Antarctica. Thank you. Go ahead. There's just the more immediate effect, though, too, that that overturning circulation is also responsible for the heat uptake and the CO2 yeah. uptake locally. So it's true enough that we're talking 1000s, 2000s for the for the entire globe to feel the direct local change in the meridional, but you're going to feel the indirect effect from what's happening in the Southern Ocean because it is our climate moderator. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to take a question over here. Thank you for taking my question. I, I, as sort of MC of this event, I feel bad posing a question, but if I understand this correctly, things are bad and they are about to get worse because of changes in ocean circulation, which is terrifying. Um, but I also understand that we're talking about very long timescales here. And when you talk in Washington, D.C. about something happening at the end of the century, it gets really hard to hold policymakers' attention. Um, and so I'm wondering, the sort of scale of the changes that you're talking about and the long time frames, can you talk for a minute about um, irreversibility or reversibility of these changes? What would happen if we cut emissions? Would things, would ice and circulation recover? Or are we talking about irreversible changes that we cannot claw back? Thank you. Wow. I'll, I'll leave that to you guys, but I'll just remind my, my panelists that when we were had a, a call in preparation of this meeting, I think that was probably one of the questions that got us in a, in a heated debate, no pun intended, um, about uh, exactly that question and whether we had already passed the point at which we could um, just turn down the dial or whether or not there were um, going to be some hysteresis in the system where we would you know, we could act to curb uh, carbon emissions, but actually would return to sort of a non-analog um, state. So anyways, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I, it was something that we, <coughs> we had a fun debate yeah, about. Yeah, I, I think the same debate is going to crop up here. But anyway, um, I'm not sure that we can do enough fast enough to prevent eventual going over this tipping point in West Antarctica. But we can make it so long and drawn out that adaptation is easier. We did just say that sea ice on the ocean surface will recover relatively rapidly if we're able to control CO2 emissions. The deeper circulation, the things that are going on with uh, um, increasing speed of the westerlies and uh, warm water reaching the coast of Antarctica might slow down if we were to take action. But again, it's not going to be a decade. And, and <sighs> I'm debating whether to launch into this. I mean, this is the challenge of global climate change. It's outside our experience of managing the world. We're not used to thinking in terms of centuries. We're not used to making plans for 100 years or 300 years in the future. And yet, that's what the challenge is, is that we have to get together as a planet and make sure that we run this place in a way that's sustainable for our generations. Otherwise, what you're saying is, oh, you know what? The human race is kind of a lost cause, and we shouldn't even try that hard. I don't believe that. And I really think that it's a challenge to DC to think in terms longer than a senator's career, a, 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 a nation's political swings back and forth. And, and that's a challenge for all of us. Accurate portrayal of the challenge. Um, 
Do we have any other hands? Okay, well, I'll turn to, uh, I'll turn back to the panel. Um, we've talked a lot about these climate challenges, climate-driven challenges, but some of these challenges are, are human, well, the climate challenge is human-derived, but in addition to that, we have some, some additional human pressures to the region. Um, we talked a little bit, this, this was my PhD, I guess, but the, the invasive pathogen potential pressure is there. Um, there are increasing numbers of scientists and tourists reaching the continent, and there is increased fisheries pressure. Um, that interfaces very closely to what our previous panels were talking about and how the future of this treaty system can endure in terms of environmental protection, conservation, and the management of Antarctic marine living resources. What do you see um, sort of the next steps in terms of the science that needs to be done and the communication that needs to be done to convey some of the challenges uh, that we have before us? Okay. <laughs> So actually, um, just spinning up some work with Cassandra Brooks, and uh, we envision um, exactly what Ted has called an action for. And so this is coming from a group of scientists, but we see that um, this problem is way bigger than any one nation, any one government, and we're going to have to form stronger collaborations with our international partners. We have to share resources, we have to share data, we have to share um, technology, and we're there, we have that capacity. And I don't know if who it was who said, just get them in the room, oh, it was the senator. You know, let's just get in the room and have a conversation. And that's exactly what our approach is going to be, is that we are just gonna start networking having this, have the open conversation and hopefully, you know, and critical to this process is to have, you know, all the stakeholders at the table um, because we can't just be between scientists and scientists. We want to have the decision makers there. We want Camler representatives in this particular case for the Southern Ocean or marine protected areas, for example. We want the fishing in industry. We want it, okay, so idealistic, I agree, but, because this happens at Camelot already, but, you know, all we can do is keep trying, and I think it's really key to keep working on that dialogue because I couldn't agree more with what Ted said. Mm. And, and I'll just say, um, I, you know, the frustration that, that Ted expressed, I think, um, you know, you think of like a, a crack, you know, a, a volcanic crack, and you've got, you know, magma oozing out. And I think that in the scientific community, I see the cracks forming, um, because for a long time, we've been sort of diligent, you know, worker bees in this, and we've been asked to, to do the science, and we do the science, and we come back. And then oftentimes, it feels like the policymakers are saying, well, can the error bars be smaller? Can you go another 100 years out? Can you make the model higher resolution? And then we go back and do that. But, but it ends up in this endless cycle where I think, um, continuing to think, I mean, as we continue to do better science, and that's important, it's no substitute for the courage that will be required at the policy level to actually do what needs to be done. Like, this can't always be just passing it back to the science community for more information, uh, smaller error bars. I think actually we, we've known what we needed to know. We've known what the risks were for quite a long time. I don't think the overarching story of climate change has changed appreciably, even as our understanding of it deepens and becomes more sophisticated. And none of that replaces, um, I think, the real courage uh, that will be required to say, no, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to open that plant. No, you can't go there. At some level, uh, the policy community is going to have to set some bounds um, because we can't, from our perspective, um, solve this problem. At some level, we're trying to assist the policy community in, in making the right decision, um, but, but that can only go so far. So I just want to be clear that um, just asking for more and more science, even as the science is continuing, is not a substitute for action. <laughs> yes, applause. Um, how, much, how are we doing? Okay, we'll take one more question. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, we had one up there. Sorry, I didn't see. Um, yeah, no, I just want to thank you for, for a really excellent panel and, and just these heartfelt uh, words. I mean, I, I work in the field of geopolitics, so let me, let me just kind of give you two observations. Number one is, I hear what you say about that frustration about we want more accuracy 
or we want that sort of margin of error reduced. I, th I think one of the one of the difficulties and, and, and really the sort of the fishing conservation issue in the Southern Ocean has really revealed this is y you also have a great deal of bad faith where uncertainty is weaponized to absolutely reinforce inaction or simply bad behavior. The other thing which I thought was really noticeable, and I'd, I'd love your, your thoughts on this, is I thought for the first time the IPC talked about climate justice. That seems to me a really big shift in, in the discourse over the last 20, 30 years, because actually one of the, one of the difficulties has been is, is the idea that somehow we're all in this together. That's patently not true. You know, where we have too much heat, too much water, or too much heat and too much water matters. And it's, it, it doesn't play out fairly. So I, I'd really be interested, picking up on kind of Ted's comments, well, that we need to think 100 years, 300 years, that has absolutely got to be manifested, oh, sorry, informed or animated, I beg your pardon, by that sense that there's, there's profound injustices here at stake. Thanks. Didn't quite hear a question, but oh, thank you. That's great. And um, yeah, I, I guess just for everybody to think about, um, if you ask somebody in the year 1950 or 1960, you know, we need to care now about what we're doing to the planet uh, um, because by the year 2000, um, you know, there'll be trouble, uh, consequences for what we do. And they would have said, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Are you kidding? Uh, the future is going to be magic. The future is going to be able to do anything they want to do. They'll solve every problem that, that might crop up. And then the 70s and 80s came along, and we became aware that we really did have global impacts. And what we did, it didn't just go away, and sometimes there weren't solutions for what we had done already. And now I think the science community and the public at large is aware that we can do things that ruin things for people for centuries to come, but we're still getting our arms around um, actually doing something about it. Thanks so much. We'll close with one last question. Could I, I just oh. have a, a quick comment on that, because I think it's a really good comment. And uh, it's discussed broadly uh, it, at funding agencies, <laughs> at, at least uh, from my perspective, and in the US. And I would add to that that I think the responsibility is on us, and the us is the international community that has the capacity. And what we need to do with that capacity is share our resources so that we can put a finer point on these changes. Yes, we know a lot, but there's still a lot we need to do to improve our model predictions, for example. And so we need those process studies. We need access to those difficult regions to access and improve those models. And so I think we need to embrace that responsibility because you're right, those who are most strongly affected do not have the capacity or the means. And parallel to that, give them the data and give them the tools so that they can at least see what's going on in their local communities, which is happening too. It's all part of bringing everyone to the table having their voice there at the table as well. I know I sound probably ridiculous, but <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't, you know, our, our hands gonna be forced. That's, that's really what we need to do. And, and there's so much that is good that can come out of that. <laughs> well, it, that's true, but yeah, and we wind up sounding idealistic and we're not, we're realists. And I know it's gonna be tough and there's gonna be a lot of, give and take and unfortunate bad actors and bad faith and uh, all of that sort of thing. And somehow we got through the first uh, 70 years of nuclear weapons without using any um, in a serious way. And uh, well, after the first unfortunate live tests. Uh, and then uh, I think we need to do the same kind of agreement and the, the fear that underlies that, you know, um, um, deterrence towards using nuclear is the, the deterrence that we should have for continuing to warm and change the planet. Um, hopefully it takes hold with the same um, gut level energizing uh, so that we, we continue to do stuff about it. I alluded to in my talk, there is an economic engine here that we are tapping into, but that really is the path to success, is to make it clear 
to the corporations of the world, the folks that want to make money at any scale, that doing so in a way that's clean or actually inventing something, innovating something that does things to uh, clean up the planet, remove carbon dioxide, use the resources in a different way that don't leave a lasting impression. Those things are taking hold. And when you get the economic engine going, and when you get a million minds, a billion minds thinking in the direction of, let's do this cleaner, I'll sell more stuff if I make electric cars, um, then you've got a path to success because, because that's the kind of thing that, that actually gets some energy behind it, behind you know, more than just impassioned words about uh, how we need to come together. When there's, when there's money and when governments can set the direction for how that money is used, that's the path to success. Thank you. Thank you. You're all really awesome. Like, <laughs> like hands down awesome, really inspirational. And I think about inspiration, I think about our youth. Um, you can't do this research forever. At some point, somebody else has to come in and continue the fight. Are you seeing an increase or a decrease in student youth involvement and in, uh, in the workforce? Increase. Yeah. A huge increase. Yeah. I, I, yeah, the, the little guys are making it tough to get money. I mean, it's <laughs> like <laughs> I, I, I will everywhere. I mean, the, student, the students are passionate, and, and you want to harness that passion. And at the same time, I think if they're looking ahead um, to, to junior faculty who, particularly in the U.S. context, given some of the constraints that we've heard about today um, on the NSF logistics side, they have to make a rational choice about how to spend their career. And right now, it's hard to make the case that Antarctic science is, is the way to go because it, it means – you know, never knowing when you're going to get deployed, projects that get delayed, the, the funding regime is really tight. Um, that, that does not look particularly attractive to, to graduate students, and they're very likely um, to go elsewhere when they, you know, to build a career, even if we train them in the Antarctic. So I think we have to really think seriously about how to fix some of these problems very quickly, or we risk the sort of lost generation of scientists who just sort of looked ahead and they were like, this looks miserable and I'm gonna go somewhere else. Um, and, I, and I really do worry about that because I think there's be a, um, a skills gap um, if we can't sort of get our house in order logistically. We also welcome STEM talent in the US government workforce. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that we also need that talent um, to be able to work together in terms of policy and science interface and to be able to get that word out. And we need to increase the ability to, um, to tap into not just the youth, but the, the desire to build an educator class um, that can really continue that. I'll just say further to Heather's point, it is the next five years that look particularly grim, and that's where this uh, lost generation could be a real, a real, a real thing. And so, international cooperation. I mean, NSF has challenges, and they're going to be there. I'm not sure NSF would be able to turn it around or make a decision differently that would really help in the next few years. They just have a lot that they need to do first. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's a real problem. And maybe the one thing NSF could do would be to encourage and support international collaboration to get that younger crew out to the Antarctic. Thanks so much. In the interest of time, um, I will thank our panel. Never have we been so privileged to have such bad news presented to us. <laughs> um, straight from the journals into the headlines and over to the Wilson Center. So I really do want to thank um, Heather, Sharon, and Ted for their time and for all of you for your participation and for this illustrious education that we've all been able to obtain today. And I'll turn it back over to Becca. Thank you to our last panel. I, I have, don't have a lot to add to Hila's kind words. An amazing lineup of speakers. I'm glad this was the last panel because I think, I don't know about you, but I need a drink. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us today in person and online. We have heard a remarkable lineup of speakers addressing a wide range of Antarctic policy issues from the history and future of the Antarctic Treaty System, U.S. influence and interests, infrastructure, science activities, climate, and more. Tomorrow, we will hear from the U.S. Coast Guard with a view from the Bridge of Antarctic Operations, as well as from the New York Air Guard, and we'll have panels on access, awareness, partners, and conservation. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow at 9 a.m. for day two of the Rules-Based Order in Antarctica, and I thank you again for your gift, the gift of your time today. <laughs>